Now we'll say a few words about passive foreign investment uh, companies. Uh, if you haven't already looked at the slides, you're going to, uh, to get the benefit of uh, uh, my artistic efforts. Oh, just what code section are we under? Uh, we're under, uh, where is it, uh, 1291 through 1297, I believe. Again, PFIX have a reasonable amount of detail. The code sections are a bit easier to read, uh, but uh, it's something which, again, you need to understand in concept, and uh, you will go to the detail when you find the need for it, uh, and the slide deck, uh, only a few slides of which I'll look at, uh, the slide deck uh, generally will have references to the code sections. Uh, we have talked about the fact that controlled foreign corporations are foreign corporations that are owned more than 50% by U.S. shareholders. And U.S. shareholders are only persons that own 10% or more of the foreign corporation. Okay, what about uh, Josh over here uh, who has, you know, a 0 .00001 interest in a foreign corporation? Okay, he's not covered by subpart F. He's not uh, covered by uh, any of the guilty rules. What about constructive attribution? Uh, that's a good point. Yes, if there are attribution, yes. Okay. Let's assume that Josh has no relatives, no friends, nobody willing to act as agent on his behalf. You know, he's just, you know, one guy who heard a rumor about some foreign investment bucks in. What is a foreign, foreign investment fund, passive foreign investment fund? Good question. So let's talk about what is a, a foreign investment company. Now, again, from the standpoint of trying to create a statute which would cover, you know, like everybody and their mother, these are broad rules. So, again, if my memory serves correct on it being 1296. It's 97. 1297, thank you. Uh, it essentially says, hey, if that Cayman Corporation has over, has 50% or more of its assets in property which produces passive income, then that's one test that will cause qualification as a PFIC. The other is 75% or more of the income is passive. What was the first one again? Can you explain that? 50% or more of the assets are assets that produce passive income. So if you have money in a bank, that produces interest income. That's passive. Now, if I remember correctly, there's probably an exception for uh, cash used in the ordinary course of business, but maybe not. I don't remember that. Uh, yes? Is that assets capable of producing passive income or assets that actually do? Uh, I, would, I haven't looked at it recently enough to be sure, but I would say capable rather than actually causing current earnings. I'd be pretty sure that's the answer. Thank you. Right, the 75% is, uh, is the yeah. income. 50% uh, of the assets are assets which create uh, passive income or are capable of it. Or 75% of the income is passive income. So there's an or test, meaning either test causes this to be a PFIC. It could be money in the bank, could be bonds. Securities, uh, equity securities. No, no, no. The fifty percent is focused on assets. Oh, okay. Yeah. What is the value of the assets that the company owns? Okay. Without regard oh, okay. to the 
the income from those assets. Without regard to the income. And then alternatively, if the passive income is over 75%. Now, uh, frankly, I don't remember what the rule is. I refer to it in the slides. But for example, think about a startup business. If there's a foreign company, it receives money from shareholders that will eventually be invested in an active business. In the first year, maybe it will, in fact, meet that 75% test uh, or the asset test because it hasn't started its business yet. This, uh, this was a problem for a long time, and I, I, I recall that there's, there's something in the rules now which create an exception for this kind of thing, but it was, it's a very uh, black and white test for the most part. So the point is, you expect a company which qualifies as a PFEC to earn income from dividends, interest, gains from trading and securities, but uh, in a, occasionally you'll see where an active business uh, unexpectedly meets these tests. So even though maybe you're working with a client which has real active operations, you still have to keep these rules in the back of your mind as you look at factually what assets do they own, what income are they earning. The reason that uh, on this slide that I show everybody being happy, of course, is because prior to the initiation of the PFIC rules, Anybody that wasn't caught, in essence, by the uh, CFC rules, which included less than 10% owners, or where there was 50% or less U.S. ownership by U.S. shareholders, anybody that was not caught by the CFC rules in uh, subpart F, uh, they were able to have full deferral on any income which was earned inside that foreign investment company. And then at some point in the future, instead of taking dividends, they would sell their shares and realize long-term capital gain. So this is the nirvana of converting ordinary income into capital gain. Now, as a result of this, uh, Congress in not liking this kind of situation, of course, uh, said, you know, what do we do? The point is, now, we have, we've talked about the fact from a jurisdictional standpoint that it's easy for me to grab Ken over here, but it's really rough to grab anybody like Eric who's sitting in the back. <coughs> so a foreign, it's, it's hard for the U.S. to directly tax a foreign corporation, especially where there's no assets and no activities physically within the United States. So as a result, like the CFC rules and now the guilty rules, uh, the way that Congress chose to apply the PFIC rules was to grab the U.S. person who is the shareholder of the PFIC. The U.S. person is the shareholder of the PFIC. He's easy to grab. Let's beat on him. Now, when I used Josh as an example before, pardon? He was happy before on the previous slide. <laughs> he was happy. But the other point, aside from his happiness, was that I said he had 0.0000001% of this company. If the U.S. is going to tax Josh as a result of something that's happening within a foreign company, can the U.S. government, the IRS, assume that Josh knows What's going on inside that company if he has this very tiny ownership interest? Remember the CFC rules and the guilty rules all make calculations based on 
the numbers inside the CFC. Josh has no practical access to those numbers. How does he fill out his tax return if he has this, you know, this inability to get the information? So what the PFIC rules do, they give three mechanisms, three mechanisms under which this new, uh, these rules, new back when they were new, they're not new now. They give three mechanisms so that Josh can appropriately pay his tax. And this gets to Jen's question of, you know, what are the mechanisms? One mechanism, which we call the default rule, which is what you find in 1291, is basically saying when Josh either sells his interest and realizes gain, or uh, if he gets a distribution which is not an ordinary distribution and there's rules as to how you determine whether something's a normal distribution or extraordinary. When he sells or gets this particular distribution, he will just be terribly beaten on the head in terms of his tax calculation. Terribly. Number one, even though Josh might normally be in a 15% tax rate, and reflecting his very small ownership interest in this thing, and the fact that he's in this program hoping his tax bracket will go up in the future. The default rule says that when he has to, you know, recognize uh, income as a result of selling the shares or getting this extraordinary dividend, when he does that, he will have to calculate tax at the highest marginal rate. So all of a sudden, Josh becomes a 37% taxpayer, 37% rate taxpayer on uh, that, uh, that amount. So the amount being taxed is taxed at ordinary income? At the highest ordinary income rate applicable to the taxpayer. And no deduction for basis? Uh, no. Uh, well, in determining the amount, uh, again, it's been a while since I've looked at the specific calculation, but uh, I believe that if he sells it, that the gain, which would be after reduction of basis, is what provides the basis for this tax. There's the tax base for this tax, but uh, that I'd have to look back on to double check, but that's what makes sense to me. Now, secondly, not only is he hit with a 37% rate instead of maybe his 15% uh, rate, which would otherwise apply to his level of, uh, of income, there's also effectively an interest charge for the number of years that he received the benefit of not paying tax on income that was realized you know, over the years in this uh, foreign company. So, number one, he's hit with a ridiculously high tax rate. Secondly, there's an interest charge. So, uh, this is referred to as the default rule. Now, I said there were three, uh, three mechanisms, default being the first one. The second and third, which I'll mention briefly, do not apply to everybody. They only apply if the conditions allow either one or both of them to apply. The second method is the uh, method for recognizing on a current basis the share for that owner of the ordinary and capital gain earned with, you know, for the year within that company. And that's called Qualified Electing Fund. If I remember correctly, I think that's defined in 1293. We said before that Josh has no knowledge. You know, he owns this little small slice of this thing. He has no knowledge of what's going on inside. How would he be able to say how much of the current the current results of operations 
our ordinary, you know, his share of them, our ordinary or capital. Well, he's not going to be able to. So the only time you have a qualified elected fund is if, in fact, the company itself provides that information in a manner which is uh, which the IRS is effectively happy with. Only in that situation can you have a qualified electing fund. Now, what's the benefit of a qualified electing fund? Number one, you're going to get ordinary income to the extent of the ordinary share, which will be taxed in Josh's case at 15% instead of 37. So that's kind of attractive. And secondly, to the extent that a portion of it is capital gain, he'll get capital gain rates. To have a qualified electing fund will normally mean a much lower absolute amount of tax. Now that's the upside. What's the, da the downside? Has Josh received the money yet? Or is the money still inside the foreign corporation, inside the PFIC? So he's got ordinary income and capital gain, but no cash to pay the tax. I have to say, frankly, I don't remember whether there is an election to defer payment of tax and as a result pay interest on it. I don't remember whether there is or not. But the point is, the basic rule, you get a lower absolute tax, but you have income and capital gain, uh, ordinary income capital and capital gain without the cash. Okay, what's the third one? Now, uh, our, uh, now you're, uh, most of you are at the, uh, let's say the start of your careers, and you probably are not yet big investors in mutual funds. Some mutual funds, can you pretty much uh, buy in and sell them at will? No. Depends on the mutual fund. <laughs> Six months, 12 months, years. Are you talking years. about tax rules, or are you talking about uh, what mutual funds uh, uh, offer in terms of a conditions of investment? Is that what you were asking? No. Oh. <laughs> what were you asking? Uh, what, I was, what I was saying is that some mutual funds you can buy in and sell and there are posted market prices at, you know, as to how much it'll cost you to buy in. How much it will benefit you if you sell, and there's how much will you receive if you sell. In other words, they're they're effectively marketable securities. So the point is, if in fact the shares in that foreign corporation are marketable, then the third option is that you can calculate each year what you can calculate on a mark-to-market basis. Let me write that uh, down because uh, uh, I'm not sure whether my enunciation is, uh, is good enough. Okay, you calculate on a mark-to-market basis. Each year, at the end of the year, you look at the price that is posted, so to speak, on the market where this is traded, and you see whether it's gone up or down. Let's say you bought it at 100. At the end of the year, it's up to 120. So you have 20 of income. And this, uh, as I recall, is treated as ordinary income. Then, let's say the next year end, it's down to 95. Okay, that's below your original 100. Okay, they allow you now a loss of 20 but not 25, I was going from 120 down to 95. They allow you to go back down to your original cost. Oh, oh so you can't calculate an actual loss. You can't go below. Okay. So this, again, is a mechanism which allows Josh to calculate his gain or loss each year and does not force him to actually go to the internal information within that foreign company. 
again, these mechanisms are really all uh, premised on the fact that Josh has no knowledge of what's going on inside that building. Again, to sort of summarize, this was meant to eliminate a hole, in a sense a loophole, through which uh, anybody could invest in foreign mutual funds and realize uh, both deferral and capital gain down the road. 